I guess um, what I'd like to do is kick off first before we open up to the um, to the audience here. Um, we so as a as someone who looks after hundreds of patients with mitochondrial disease, um, first of all, this is exciting legislation. This is a wonderful technique. Um, perhaps if I could ask um, our our panelists, what uh, what are the challenge? What are the what are the greatest challenges that you think a partner company like Australia should should be uh, trying to answer um, to introduce this new technique? Um, and what are the milestones that we should be trying to uh, achieve um, to get there? I can say that one of the things you will need to do—it's on. Yeah, it's on. Okay, good. Well, one of the things you will need to do to introduce these techniques is to be able to create embryos specifically for research. You know, while I think the work we're doing will pave the way, I think any clinic wanting to offer this should do it first as a research project to show that they can do it in their hands with with minimal mitochondrial DNA carryover and minimal impact on the developmental potential of the embryo. So I think that would be an important an important thing to get through. Okay. That's a good start, I think. Let's get the techniques right. Um, Nancy. I think creating the landscape as well. So very lucky in the UK that we have a um, variety of bodies and institutions which engage the public and policymakers in science. Um, and I think Newcastle did the work engaging very early on with people, <coughs> Doug and Mary were engaging back in 2006 and 2007 even, um, really before their, their paper came out in 2010, so I think that's very important. Um, the patients, I can't overemphasize the importance of the patients in this because at the end of the day, it's about them, it's about them wishing to use these techniques to avoid children with mitochondrial disease. Well, in addition to the obvious thing I would say, which is have a public debate around some of the moral and ethical implications of this technology, I would say um, marshalling stakeholders. So working out who we want to have involved in trying to convince the various people that will need to be convinced about this, bearing in mind that we live in a federation and so it's going to be incredibly complex to undertake any legal changes that we determine that we'd like to lobby for. So um, working out who can be in our team is an important step. I think um, as Nancy highlighted in her presentation, uh, the community engagement, uh, parent stakeholders are incredibly important here. So I think a really important role that the AMDF will be able to play is in engaging with the general public and getting them uh, on board, understanding what the issues are. And, and they're really the strongest, going to be the strongest advocates they are going to make our politicians sit up and take notice, I think. All right, so we know our first step. Perhaps I can ask... Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, Rhonda, so what, what first steps do we need to take to try and get uh, mitochondrial donation therapy here? What, how would you see... Uh, what would you see as being important in trying to lead to that pathway? You've got um, a couple of children you've told us who'd, 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 you'd like to undergo mitochondrial replacement therapy. What sort of steps would you like to see um, to bring this? I would like to see um, a different thing to the talks today. I would really like to see um, some more lobbying um, in Parliament for, um, because it sounds like it's such a long process to get um, passed um, and I would like to see that happen in a hurry. Um, my children, as I said, are, are 14 and 16 so they will be having their own children say the next 10 <laughs> minimum years. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so you, I would really like to see the technology available in Australia um, as soon as possible. And I think um, I think there are a, a few mitochondrial disease sufferers in the audience. And I think if we all start sharing our stories, that might be you know a way to make that start to happen. Okay, so uh, Mary, you've uh, you've been a trailblazer in these techniques. How do we convince our local Australian IVF centre 
to do a technique which is is going to take years to perhaps have legislations passed through to actually undertake um, trying to develop this technology. How can we encourage them to to do that and take that on? Um, I think make funding available <laughs> for the research would be a key thing. Right. Um, also, I mean, if you've got if you've got robust regulation, it becomes it is it's sometimes a pain to have to jump through all those hoops, but it becomes sort of safer environment to do research in as, as a scientist, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think if you've got if you've got robust regulation and you've got funding, well, I think it should be easy enough to convince them to <laughs> take it on. All right, so we'll speak to our chairman and our scientific panel chairman uh, to, to raise funding for, uh, for to, to try and develop these techniques. Um, if we are lucky to convince someone in the laboratory, in the IVF laboratory, to be able to do this and be able to do this appropriately, um, do they need to link in with your group, for example? Do we need to then start working on policy? Should all of these things be done concurrently? So actually, I should say in response to your previous one, when I talk to IVF audiences about this technique, there is immense interest. Not alone do they want to use it for mitochondrial disease, they want to use it for a lot of other things for which it is not appropriate. Um, so I think an important thing would be to rein them in as well and say, you know, <laughs> just for mitochondrial disease. Yeah. Because there is a theory abroad that it can be used for to cure aging and so on, which is, there is no evidence to support that. In fact, anything we know about it tells us this will actually probably make it worse. Yeah. So I think, I think you won't have problems engaging people, especially if you offer funding, but you must really make it clear that it's for mitochondrial disease. In the US, they're running into problems because they probably won't be able to stop it being used for this aging witchcraftery that <laughs> <laughs> goes on. So, yeah. Okay. Excuse me, can, can you just repeat what you said a bit louder? I couldn't hear about America. Okay, so um, when, I, when I speak to I, our audiences I, of IVF people, there is a lot of interest in these techniques, and they're keen to use them for not just for mitochondrial disease, but for other causes of infertility, especially the female aging effect. Because as women get older, their eggs decline in quality, they get chromosomal abnormalities. But the thing is, by the time we collect those eggs for IVF treatment, things have already gone wrong. So any intervention we do that's after their collection will not help. So I think it's important in regulation if, if future regulation in Australia to say these techniques are allowed for mitochondrial disease because otherwise they will be used for indications for which there is no evidence that they will work. And, and also I think if you start using it for other reasons for the age effect, you confound the evidence in the future because I think follow-up of children will be important from these techniques. And if you're already using sort of defective eggs to start with, you're going to make it very, very difficult to interpret the results. So I think it will be important to say this should only be used for these for the for these diseases. So the round of this, I mean, we've we've our research has shown that there's over a hundred thousand Australians that could potentially uh, benefit from this therapy. And I think your own studies that you published in New England Journal suggest that there were more than a hundred of women of childbearing age that could actually benefit from this therapy um, each year. Uh, if I'm not wrong, could I maybe I can throw it to the audience? Are there is there anybody in the audience who uh, would consider this? Uh, therapy, if it were available, and or know of somebody um, who who might be able to use this technique. So maybe we can just ask uh, um, that you could volunteer some sort of some sort of situation rather than putting poor old Rhonda in the in the gun again. <coughs> what questions would you like to? So let's assume that we can get an IVF um, centre to offer this to Australian. Um, families, what would, what sort of questions would you be asking um, to your potential doctor? Um, well, my brother, her son, suffers from MELAS and we see what he goes through on a daily basis. So it's really hard to kind of think what would my future kids be like? And what's being kind of guaranteed that it is very, very strongly suggested that I have it uh, it's obviously come from my mum and I would never wish anybody upon this disease so anything that could prevent that would be uh, a godsend really so that's it. 